okay? Just don't, don't judge that, please. <laughs> so um, I am going to share with you today about building community, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to start with, um, I wanted to center Patricia Hill Collins' article, The New Politics of Community, because you know, once we get into it a little bit um, more, we're gonna discuss what it means, um, what community actually means and how it has been politicized, the idea of it has been politicized. But before we get there, I would like to acknowledge that I am an uninvited guest on the lands, the stolen lands of the Coast Salish people. I am forever grateful and indebted to them for allowing me to be here, to work here, to live here, and of course, to play here. How are you showing up in this space today? Um, I'm grateful to Jessica for starting us off with uh, really kind of centering our intentions for today and how we're gonna be sharing this space. I usually ask this question and I, I ask people to share how they're showing up in a space, but we really don't have time for that, I don't think. Um, I'm not 100% sure how much time is allotted. I think it's just an hour. So, you know, I have some, some kind of important things that I want us to be able to discuss. Um, so if we can just think about how we're showing up in this space and what it is you hope to gain from this space, um, let's do that. And then as I'm going through the, the presentation, if you have questions, tensions, um, comments, just please put them in the chat or raise your hand and you know, please feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind that at all. So what is happening in international schools? Um, we know that there's, there's a lot. I know that there's a lot. I don't know we know that there's a lot that's happening in international schools with regards to um, DEI, meaning diversity, equity, and inclusion, with regards to justice. Um, I don't know if everyone is privy to the same information that I have because I am talking to people because of my uh, doctoral research. Um, but I hope that we do know that there are some huge issues in terms of not just access, but equity, um, in terms of uh, exclusion, uh, people not feeling like they belong in certain communities, people not being treated as if they belong in certain communities. There's a lot of othering um, and there is racism. I want to show two videos and I wanna show two videos because we're going to um, focus on what's happening in these videos and then we're gonna have a discussion about the impact of what's happening in these videos. Um, in, 19, in the 1940s, I think it was, maybe the 1950s, uh, doctors Kenneth and Mamie Clark did the doll test and they did these doll tests um, to help support the Brown versus uh, Board of Education um, uh, court case. And they were basically proving the long lasting effects of segregation on African-American children. So these tests have been replicated numerous times. So what I'm going to show you are two videos. I'm gonna show you um, one video of this test taking place in Italy. And then I'm gonna show you a video of this test taking place in Singapore. And I would like for you to make your own sense of what is happening in these videos. Quale bambola è bianca? Quale bambola è nera? Quale delle due è bella? Questa. Qual è quella bella? Qual è quella brutta? 
E qual è quella buona? Quale è cattiva? Qual è buona? Perché è buona? Perché gli occhi celesti. Quale è cattiva? Perché è cattiva? Perché è tutto, tutto vero. Qual è la bambola? Quale bambola è nina? First one. Yeah, this one. Because the skin is shiny. This one, mm -hmm. this one, and this one. Because this is black, baby. Because the brown is so dark. He is no cute. I think this one. Can you say them to me? One plays me and all the other never plays me. Because I like the beach color. This one. This one. This is the third one. Because I just know brown is smart. Because my father is smart. Is it this one? Because the skin is almost the same. Come on, see. That brown. This, this one. Mm, this doll. I want to be born beach color. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we're going to stop there. What I want um, to, I want you to take about five minutes to have a discussion about your takeaways um, from those two videos, and then we'll we'll come back. Can I create groups? Can I do that, or does someone else have to do that? We can do it. Okay. Just five minutes. Is everyone back? Okay. Okay. So, anyone want to share some of their takeaways from that video? I'll take three people to share.
Don't all volunteer at once. Come on. Yeah, so I'll jump in. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, and Cynthia, you were in my group, so you heard this already. But yeah, it was just, just so crazy to see. Um, and as you mentioned, how recent that video was. The, the Singapore one, I should be more specific. Just a year old, and we're still seeing children um, identify with those who are lighter skinned to be better, to be smarter, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, knowing Singapore and the region of Southeast Asia, you know, it's not a huge surprise because of the amount of whitening and brightening creams that are present, um, you know, as far as advertised and what children see in the magazines, on the TV shows and all that stuff like that. It's the, the lighter skin, the whiter skin is preferred um, in many of the international schools when they advertise their school to, to prospective families, they always show their, the white, the white teachers, right? They don't want anyone of, of color um, really to be in the, in the advertising um, spaces. So, I mean, it's just subliminal messaging nonstop for young children. Thank you, Alex. Sandy? No, go ahead with the next person, then yeah, yeah. You sure? Okay. Um, well, I don't think there is a next person. Anyone else? I'm sorry. I chatted with, I said, popped it in the chat that I, I would go. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to share. Um, I was just saying with my group that so much of my conversation on these issues has been with teachers or with high schoolers. And now I'm back in the classroom at a grade six level. And I think for me, watching that kind of hits a little differently because I have children in my classroom who are little and a grade six feels very young for me, having taught mostly in high school. Um, and so I think just the reality of what, what my students are sitting with and, and absorbing every single day. And Isabel brought up a good point and, you know, like we have these conversations with our colleagues, with our parents, oh, our students are too young to talk about these things. Yeah. And, and so I'm going to, I'm going to put my, I've, I've seen the video, but now I'm glad for the reminder because next department meeting where I'm told our oh, students are too young, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think mm -hmm. the age really hit home. Yeah. Thank you, Danielle. Fandy, would you like to go now? Uh, no, I was, okay, I was just saying that no, no matter how many times you watch it, it's always so heartbreaking mm -hmm. because it seems like everything is just snowballing, right? Like uh, so many factors that are amplifying this. And sometimes I, I feel just so powerless. I know that we are powerful, but I feel like it's such a big snowball commercial interest, media, and just every child that poisons themselves and, and, and don't see the, the goodness in them is just so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We are in the business of educating. And I don't mean business as in um, you know, capitalistic commercial. I mean, we are charged with educating. And whether you are educating young minds or you're educating um, adult minds, we are in the business of educating. What we have to ask ourselves is what exactly um, is being taught? What messages um, are our students learning? And if there is a, um, a consistent message of uh, inferiority, of bias, of, of hierarchies, racial hierarchies, uh, um, power dynamics, in power imbalances, um, it is irresponsible for us to think that our young students are not also getting those messages, getting those lessons. We don't have to state them explicitly. We don't have to tell them directly. They are getting them, regardless of whether or not we are willing to engage in the conversations with them, regardless of whether or not we're willing to disrupt it, they are getting the messages. And so today we're gonna to talk about community, but we're gonna talk about community a, a little differently. We're gonna talk about 
what it means to be in community with one another, what it means to lead a community, and how do we build community with people who don't value and believe in community? Because, you know, we are contending with a lot of different cultural traditions, norms, behaviors, um, a lot of different ideologies when we step into international schools, honestly, when we step into any school. And so we have to navigate all of that and we have to figure out then how do we show up and how do we lead in a space where we actually have to teach people how to be in community with one another? Because in order for us to actually begin to disrupt some of what we saw in those videos, we all have to be on the same page. We all have to be of one accord in that way. We can have different political ideologies. We can, we and we do have very different identities, um, identity constructs, and even beliefs about uh, those identities. However, we are educators. That is our shared interest. And so we have to be in community on that. And so what that looks like and how you do that in your space is going to depend largely upon you as an individual. Now, I know not everyone here is a DEIJ lead, but many of you do have influence. And so we have to make sure that as people who are quite influential in spaces that we actually are speaking the same language because we actually do share community with one another as well. When connected to projects of contentious politics, love becomes central to political action. We are at a very contentious time in education. There are people who are passionate and committed about transforming spaces. There are people who are working tirelessly to build inclusive spaces. There are people who are super committed to making sure that you know, they are diversifying their, um, their faculty and staff and, and that people are stepping into a culture of belonging and there are people who aren't. In order for us to navigate these spaces, to work in these spaces, and sometimes even live in these spaces if you are um, um, a boarding school, you know, you have to begin to kind of understand what it means to, um, to, to, to not just be in the community, but to also um, work within the work with creating a consciousness of community. And that's where we're tending to fall short in international schools. We're showing up in these spaces and we think that just because we're there, that the community is a given and it's not. If you read the essay by Patricia Hill Collins, you know that community in and of itself, just the very idea of community is quite politicized. Who um, is seen as community members, how that community um, thrives, how that community is structured, depends largely upon those who, just like in schools, um, create policy, those who are the most influential, and, and those who have the most power. And so we have to um, navigate all of those dynamics within the communities that we share. This is a a model for racial literacy. But I want us to, to not focus on the racial literacy aspect because really each one of these steps is what, can, what we can use to transform any space. It doesn't have to just focus on you know, racial equity. This is about uh, disrupting bias. This is about making sure our spaces are more inclusive. This is about curating a culture of belonging. And the foundation of this framework is critical love. And it's hard to do that. And I, and I trust me, as someone who does this work, has been doing this work for quite some time, it is hard to center love, especially when you are being dismissed, especially when you are being invisibilized, especially when people are not looking at you as an expert because 
you don't share their identity or you don't speak the way they speak or you don't have the same language, you don't have the same academic background. It is hard. It is really hard to operate from a foundation of love in, in, in those instances. But when you are leading, especially when you are leading, you have to center love. And it doesn't have to be love for the people outside of you. It can be love for the work that you're doing. The reason, the thing that keeps me going, literally the thing that keeps me going to Mulgrave and doing this work is that I love humanity. I know we can do better. I believe that with every fiber of my being, that we don't have to continue to perpetuate the same systems and ideologies that are toxic and dehumanizing. I know that we can do better. And that's what fuels my drive and my passion to keep doing this work. Critical love. So you start there. That's the, that's the very foundation of doing this work. And then you move to critical humility. That means you have to understand that everybody is not gonna agree with you. They're just not. <laughs> you are contending with not decades of conditioning and normalizing hierarchies, but you are contending with centuries of it. You are not going to disrupt that overnight. You're not going to disrupt that in a week. You're not, honestly, it's, it's going to take a, a long time before you disrupt that. I had a, um, a divisional principal come to me yesterday. And she was probably one of my most, I don't want to say resistant. She was open. But she was my, my most resistant in terms of actually seeing a change. She came to me yesterday and she showed, showed me this, this, this picture. And she was like, Cynthia, what do you see in this picture? And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't know what's in there. Let me see, what's, what's in it? She was incensed, she was upset. And she was like, look at all these faces. It was a picture of about 12 faces and it was a local law office. And they were um, bragging about all of their new hires. And she said, look at all these faces. And I looked and I was like, oh, wow. She said, no, what about this person? And she was upset. She was so upset. She said, I can't believe this is 2023. <laughs> and for her, for me, that was a win. Because she was one of the most resistant people when it came to diversifying her division. She didn't understand. Even when we pointed it out to her, she got upset that every person she hired for her division was a young white woman. She argued, she debated, she you know, maintained that she was not doing it intentionally, that she really was choosing the best candidate. And we were all like, no, no. So for her to know, and she said it, she pointed out herself, she said, she said, you know, it's because of you that I noticed it. And she said, I get it now. I so get it. <laughs> so that is a win. And that is a win that took a year and a half in the making. Do you understand what I'm saying? This work is it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to transform spaces overnight. But what you cannot do is you absolutely cannot isolate the folks who really need to hear you and hear your perspective the most. You cannot isolate those folks. And so we move into critical reflection. And that means that we have to consistently be in reflection of our own practice. How are we showing up in spaces? How are we connecting with our community members? Are we reaching out? Are we talking? Are we sitting down? Are we having coffee chats? Are we doing one-on-ones? Are we inviting them, even the most difficult ones, into our space so that we can have a conversation, so that we can begin to understand why they are so resistant? Are we getting to know one another? That's what we have to do. We have to sit in critical reflection of our own practice consistently. Because if we're leading this work or we're advising or we're consulting, you have to make sure 
that your own practice is one that demonstrates that you really and truly are serious about building community, about nurturing relationship, relationships. And then you have to have the historical literacy. Know your stuff. Know the experiments that have been done. Know the articles that have been written. Know who the, the scholars are in the DEI space. They're not called DEI scholars. And you have to know that. They're called culturally responsive scholars, culturally relevant scholars. They're called critical race theory scholars, critical whiteness theory scholars, critical studies. Feminists, so discrit, that's disability. Lat crit. You have to know those scholars. You have to know what they've what they've uh, written. You have to know uh, the theories, the the frameworks. You have to know all of that. You have to know all of that. That's not something that is optional. So whether or not you decide to 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 get another degree, or whether or not you decide to to just do it because you should, because you are occupying that space as a leader do it. You have to do it because your community is relying on you to be the expert. The archaeology of self. So again, this is about us doing some more critical reflection, but understanding that we have our own stuff that we are navigating. We have biases just like anybody else, we have beliefs, just like the people in our community, we have you know, ideas that we need to make sure we are interrogating consistently because we need to understand how we're showing up in that space, how other people are gonna perceive us occupying that space. And if at any time, any of that, gets in the way of doing the work, you have to sit in critical reflection of that and you have to pivot. And then finally, interruption. So once you've done all of that, and this is something that you're gonna do consistently over and over and over and over again, then you interrupt. That's when it's time for you to really do the work in the space because you've gone through each one of those steps. So critical love, critical humility, reflection, historical literacy, the archeology span of self, unpack, 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 interrogate, interrogate, and interrogate some more, and then you do the work. I'll pause for a second. Any questions, tensions, thoughts? Okay, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? The fact of the matter is this, we know that many of these spaces are deeply entrenched in whiteness. We know this. Is it necessary for us to that out every single time we have a discussion? No, we know this. Just consider that something that, that, that is, is understood by all of us doing this work. What you do when you point that out with every single discussion is you begin to isolate folks. You begin to push them away. You begin to turn them off from wanting to do the work. Is it right? No. We should be able to say the thing, right? We should be able to have conversations about white supremacy and how it shows up in our spaces. We should be able to say, yeah, that's a really racist policy or procedure that you're engaging in. And we should be able to say those things. We're not there yet. So do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? I want to be effective and I want everybody who is doing this work to be effective. We cannot afford to isolate the very people that we are expecting to help us change or transform these spaces. Those 
are not just our colleagues, but those are the people who are going to be the ones to help you get the work done. And they will. It may not be right away. It may take some time, but they will. They will when you have a relationship with them. They will when they respect you. They will when they trust you. And that's like any relationship, honestly. So this is not about us being right. We already know we're on the right side of history. That's a given. This is about us being effective. So we can't with, lead with ego, we have to lead with love. And that's our goal, to lead with love. Okay, building bridges. Now, um, this one is, is a bit of a hot button topic. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm, I'm going to invite you guys to, to ask questions to, um, I'm not reading the chat, so I hope you guys aren't asking questions in the chat because I, I, I can't, I can't focus on both at the same time. <laughs> um, um, but we're not building bridges to the detriment of our well being. I'm going to say that one more time. We are not building bridges to the detriment of our well being. Okay. And I'm going to get into that in a second. So when I say building bridges, I mean, you are facilitating connection making, you are getting to know community members, you are promoting the shared social interests of the community, you're normalizing the acceptance of difference, you're centering care and well-being, and you're building community consciousness. It does not mean that you are allowing yourself and others to be harmed. It does not mean you're going to fail to advocate for yourself and others, if that's your role. It does not mean you're going to center the comfort of policymakers. And it does not mean you're going to isolate community members whom, with whom you disagree. So when I say we're building bridges, we're not doing it with people who are harming us. That is not the ask. That is not the expectation. If you are being harmed, I would hope that you would advocate for yourself. I understand that that's not easy for everyone. I acknowledge that. But I would hope that you would find a way to maybe have someone else advocate for you, if that's the case. So when we build bridges, we have to understand that in order for there to a community to exist, because just us sharing a space isn't necessarily a community. It just means we're all sharing the same space. But in order for a community to exist, we have to actually know one another. One of the reasons why I've been able to do so much work at MoRiv is because I get to know everybody, literally. And they will tell you. They call me a social butterfly. I'm really not that social. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm really not that social. I am, I am a true ambivert. Because outside of work, I really just like my, my alone time in my, my own space. But at work, I understand what my job is. And my job is to build community. So I talk to a lot of people. I create a lot of opportunities for people to engage with one another. That's one of the reasons why we have so many book studies. They don't know this, though. I didn't tell them that. That we have so many book studies because I want to get them to know one another across divisions. They know each other within their divisions, but across divisions, that's our, that's our Achilles. That's where we have challenges. So we have a lot of book studies. And I've been working with our um, social committee to do a lot more social outings outside of school. So there are a lot of things that we do outside of school uh, to encourage those cross-divisional cross connections. I do a lot of work in getting to know my community. I meet with parents almost once a month now. I've been meeting with various groups of parents. I know the board very, very well. We have had retreats. I have gone to meetings. 
I know them personally. I met them. We've sat down and had coffee. Um, they've invited me to coffee. Students, you know, we, I engage with them. I teach a character ed class. That's one way. And I teach that in grades 12, 10 and 12. And then we have a variety of different clubs. I'm not the GSA advisor, but I go to their meetings because I want them to know that I am, you know, an ally. Um, I, I, I show up for the people in the community as often as I can. And because I do that, other people see me doing that and they're like, oh, I should probably do the same. And they do. So people are looking at you as a leader, whether you're a DEI lead or not, as a leader, to know how to engage with the rest of the community. It's important. And so in order for us to really have a community, a true community with that shared social interest, right, of disruption, you have to make sure that you are modeling what it is you expect from everybody else. Many of us will not share the same identities nor political affiliations, but we all have the same shared interests of educating students. So I want us to take what I've stated so far, and I want us to just engage in a conversation. What time is it? Oh, we're a little over. It's okay, five minute conversation. Okay, five minutes, just five minutes. And maybe make the groups a little bigger this time. So a five minute conversation about how you can move forward in your space with building community. I always do that. I start talking. <laughs> I'm going in and on mute. <laughs> But what I would say was, we just had an amazing conversation in our uh, breakout uh, group. Laura, I'm not sure if you are willing. I hope you are. But could you share that last part that you were just sharing with us? Well, we were talking about um, making change. And and so they went back to your story of um, the woman that you'd worked with um, and got her coming in and sharing her sharing that story about the change that had been made. And what I said was... Um, you had shown the way forward by being open and learning and modeling the learning. And then I went on from there and it's, it's very hard for people um, in, in scenarios like that because it shows your vulnerability. And that's, a, a, you know, in anybody's role, but in, especially in leadership role, showing vulnerability is an uncomfortable place to be. And yet we have to, to make change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That was so powerful. And you're so, so right. It is very difficult for most of us to be vulnerable. And, and, and there is a, a lot of, of historical baggage that goes along with that for some of us, right? Because showing any sign of weakness for many of us is detrimental to access you know, if you show a, a, a sign of weakness and uh, sometimes, unfortunately, vulnerability is is interpreted as a weakness, you know, then maybe you shouldn't be a leader. Maybe you shouldn't lead that department, you know, and 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 so for some of us, it is women. Minoritized, marginalized individuals, you know, it can be. um it, it can it can be quite um, scary to be willing to be vulnerable, to be willing to say, oh, I don't know it all, to be willing to say, I am a, lear a learner. I am showing up in this space as a learner, even though I know you've hired me as an expert, there are still areas in which I am growing and learning. And it really is okay to say that. So thank you, Laura. That was quite powerful. I appreciate that. So we're going to um, start to wrap up a little bit, but I, I want to just go over a couple of other points. And that's the co-creation, co the co-creation of community. Remember again that as leaders, um, whether you're leading, uh, you know, in the DEI space, 
um, but that's what we're talking about specifically. So I will I will focus on that. You know, we are we are charged with co-creating community. We are not just simply going into these spaces and telling folks, hey, this is what this community should look like. You are centering the voices of your community members. You are especially centering the voices of your most marginalized and vulnerable community members. What does community look like for them currently? And where do they want to go? Where do they want it to, what do they want it to look like? How do they want to be able to be in that community? The most vulnerable segment of our school community are our LGBTQ plus members. When I sat or when I sit in conversation with them and I ask them, what do you want, what do you, what do you want Mulgrave to look like for you? They tell me they want to be able to go anywhere throughout that school and feel safe, physically, psychologically, emotionally. They tell me that they want to, they want to see that when they have been harmed, someone is actually not being punished, but that they are, that they do have a consequence. Because right now they feel like there are no consequences in our school for harm. They tell me that, you know, they want to be able to wear clothes that have been deemed for a specific gender, even when they don't, when they don't, when they don't identify as that gender. And that's what I'm working on. That's what we're working on. I had a student send me an email and he, that is his pronoun, he said, you know, I want to wear a dress tomorrow. I said, wear your dress. He said, I don't know that I'm safe to do it. I said, you are safe to do it. He said, what if, I said, don't worry about it. I got you. And I meant that. And I did. I let two people, two other people know. I didn't tell anyone else. I just let his divisional principal know that he was going to wear a dress. And I let the school counselor know that he was going to wear a dress and that he was to be protected. And I told him, I said, if anyone says anything to you, come to me directly. He wore his dress and nothing happened. And that's how I know that we've grown tremendously. And those are the spaces that we have to co-create. We have to listen to them. We have to ask them what it is they want. This is not about us going and, and, and implementing our own agendas. Yeah, we, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. We know the right thing to the right thing to do. We have all of this knowledge in our heads and all of these theories and these ideologies and these frameworks. And we're like, yeah, this can I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. No, that is not the way it works. You have to co-create with your community members. This is not about you. This is about the community. And that's one of the first steps in building community, actually centering their voices, listening to them. What are they saying they need? It's not up to you to decide what they need. You have to listen to what they've said they need. And again, we've, I think we've said this quote so many times in these spaces, I can't, I can't even count now how many times we've used this quote. You will not dismantle the master's house with the master's tool. We have to be willing to do things differently. And what that differently is, is gonna look different in each organization. It's gonna look different in, 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 in countries, <laughs> honestly. But you have to be willing to do things differently, to not just mimic what has already been done. You have to be willing to create your own frameworks. 
That's what I did. You have to be willing to center the voices of your community members. You have to be willing to work with people who you don't have an affinity with, who you don't share an identity with. We've seen what happens when people refuse to do that. Why would we want to mimic that? So we have to be willing to do the hard thing. And I know for some of us that is emotionally laborious. I'm not gonna show that video. I know for some of us that's emotionally laborious, but we still have to be willing to do it. A school community organizer, as, as school community organizers, we cannot create a framework of organization that perpetuates an us versus them mentality. We've had enough of that. We are in this together, y'all. We are in this together, no matter what our identities are, no matter what our political leanings are, we are in this together. We are sharing this international school ecosystem. We are navigating this ecosystem. We are, and, and, and the international school ecosystem is still quite small. So many of us are navigating the same spaces time and time and time again. We cannot create us versus them mentalities. We cannot, we cannot do that. We cannot afford to do that. If we are serious about disrupting the racism and discrimination that is taking place in this ecosystem, that means we have to work together. That is the only way forward. And then finally, bell hooks, my girl. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move against domination, against oppression. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move toward freedom, to act in ways that liberate ourselves and others. We do this work because we love. That really is why we're doing the work. Some of us are suffering harm, but we still do it because we love. And so we have to start from a foundation of critical love. And that's it. Thank you. If we can get some virtual love to Cynthia, <laughs> representing Mulgrave School. And as she said, so many jewels and gems that were dropped. So much food for thought as we think about community. Think about ADOC as a community, think about your schools as a community, teams you serve on as a community in so many different places and spaces that were in and of itself. And bottom line, coming back to, to love, thinking about um, what I was gonna call it yesterday with some folks and uh, we started talking about our why and that piece on racial literacy development center that you showed and saying coming back to constantly being engaging in that process, consistently coming back to that. Um, and I behoove us all, you know, as we again embark in the new year, constantly come back and look at your why, think about your why, why we do the things we do. Um, is it rooted in love? Is it rooted in community? Um, Y'all hear me say, if it's self or this motives that in our individual, it's not for us. How is that benefiting the ecosystem? How is that benefiting the community? Um, how is that benefiting the collective and, pro and making progress and moving forward? But before we go, we still got time. If there's any questions, hop on in here, pop on in here. Um, you can put them in the chat um, or raise your hand or just hop on in here. I do have a question for you, Cynthia. Thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. Um, I, I'm thinking about what you said about centering the most marginalized. And often what I, what I tend to see is when the most marginalized are centered, which is necessary for all of us to be liberated, the people who feel like they're in the middle feel kind of like their privileges are gonna be taken away. Right, so they're not necessarily people who have 
um, a lot of privileges themselves, but they have maybe more than the most marginalized, and they feel that we constantly focus on the most marginalized. And I'm in this space where I'm not sure how to deal with that because their <clears throat> their emotions are valid and what they're saying are valid. And I'm also trying to explain to them why uplifting the most marginalized will benefit everybody. But it's not really resonating yet because it's not coming from the top either. It's little tiny me who's trying to explain, but it's not really within the culture. And I'm wondering what I can do about something like that. Uh, I'm not asking for a checklist or anything like that. It's just something to think about. What, what do we do when people who are in the middle feel that they're being left out because we're so focused on the most marginalized? I really just just need to leave it unmuted. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I struggle with that so much. I, I think the the first thing you have to do is kind of unpack why they think they're in the middle. That's the first thing. Let's unpack that. I don't know if you've done the, the power and privilege wheel, but you know, this isn't this, we don't, we don't want to get into um, a situation where we are perpetuating oppression Olympics. Who is the most mar who is the most marginalized? Who is the, the least privileged of us all? And we have to make sure, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that because it 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 does then creates this tension of 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 um competition. And it's not a competition. So it's about understanding that you have access to more privilege and more power than another group. There's enough for all of us. Giving them more access and more privilege doesn't diminish your access nor your privilege. Your access to power and privilege is what I meant to say. And I, that's the, the message that, that, that they should get. And I, I think I know exactly what it is you're talking about. Um, I remember that from one of our conversations, but I don't think that, you know, I, I don't think that their concerns should be dismissed. I think that it's just a matter of sitting in conversation, looking at that wheel, looking at where they fall within in terms of their access or you know their proximity to the power and privilege of the center of that wheel, and then looking at where the others may also fall, and then understanding and contextualizing it, saying, "Hey, you know, we actually because we are here, we actually can do more for them, so that they have more access to this power and privilege, like we do." Yeah, I hope it's okay for me to, to jump in. Um, I had a, a question and I'm curious to see what others may have to say about this as well. But um, I don't know if you're familiar with Andrew Tate. Um, yeah, and so I know a lot of schools, my school included, um, we're, we're dealing with, with the whole Andrew Tate following um, amongst our, our, our male students. And, you know, I'm having conversations with some of my students and it's pretty clear where I stand, you know, um, obviously not, uh, I mean, it's, it makes me sick, the things to hear Andrew Tate and the things that he says, and to know that he's influencing so many young men and young people. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know what have your, how, what has your school done? Or what are some things that you're you're talking about and how to approach the situation? And then also too, with the generation as it is, social media is so accessible. They have these influencers in their face all the time. So they may be like, oh, my teacher who is, I know, and you know, someone I can lean on or someone I can go to for guidance, whatever it may be, they tell me one thing, but here I am, I go home in my room and I'm scrolling all day watching videos of this person telling me all these things. And then maybe like, I don't know how to feel about this, right? So like, it's, we have this kind of battle maybe taking place of like controlling the mind, not controlling the mind, but influencing uh, the youth. And so with social media, it becomes so much harder for us as educators because, you know, they can, like I said, open up their phone and just be immersed in that world for hours. 
one of the things that we did was we actually brought in an outside group um, who did a workshop series with our um, male students on toxic masculinity. And that lasted, that was last year. And so that lasted, lasted over the course of the year. And so they, um, um, they did that workshop. I think it was, I wanna say it was five different workshops over the course of last year. And um, there were two of our uh, male teachers who were assigned to kind of like be the support for that group of, of students because we found it just in our upper schools so or our grade grades 10 through 12 was where we encountered the most of um, that uh, uh, <laughs> the um, sharing of of Andrew Tate ideals I'll just say that um, and so those two male teachers then have been charged with kind of like following that group um, and just, you know, checking in consistently to see where they are, um, being on the lookout for any kind of what we call backsliding into, you know, a regurgitation of those ideas. And, you know, so far, so good. So far, so good. Um, and, and it could be one of those things where it's just compliance. Could be, could be. And maybe once they graduate, they'll expouse those ideas again outside of, of you know, the uh, outside of, of Mulgrave. And at that point, fine. But right now, we 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 want to eliminate the harm that was being done to our um, our um, uh, uh, community members who identify as girls. So that was the most important part for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm gonna go back on mute. Y'all know it takes me a long time to get off mute. Okay. <laughs> All right, so there are no more questions. We thank you all and thank you, Cynthia, just for opening us up into the, this new year, this new space. Um, and happy Lunar New Year to those who are celebrating at this time. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are so grateful just for the words of wisdom that have been dropped. Cynthia is a reference. Make sure if you need to, if you need our contact information, let us know. Um, we saw her in action in October. Um, she's in various virtual spaces, the work that John and her collectively and the board and her staff, um, she shares openly. Um, but at the same time, like she just said, she has a framework so <laughs> that she has developed. So, um, but we just are so appreciative of just to have her in the community um, to share and we thank you all. So we'll, we'll close there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again for sharing time and space with me today. It's been so amazing seeing your beautiful faces, and I hope you have an amazing new year. <laughs>